Assalamu alaikum dear students, I am Dr. Jamil Abbas uh, from the Physiology Department, FMU. And here is a lecture regarding your insulin. We have uh, uploaded one uh, video how the insulin is going to be secreted and what are the different mechanisms action of uh, structure of this receptor and how this uh, receptor is going to perform its duties. Now, this video is concerned with the uh, different effects of insulin uh, on the carb for carbohydrate metabolism fat metabolism or in the brain or in the other areas so let's start with the effect of insulin the carbohydrate metabolism basically this insulin is responsible for the metabolism for the metabolization of the glucose we are mainly concerned with the glucose in this portion then very important thing regarding this one because this carbohydrates is can be taken easily without any sort of the insulin uh, in the beta cells because they have got the GLUT2 receptors but the muscle uptake the insulin also causes the movement of the glucose into the muscle cells striated muscle mainly the skeletal muscle into the adipose tissues or in the striated muscle of the heart to some extent so how it's going to be uptake of the glucose is going to occur which is normally the 15 percent they can up muscle can take up up to 15 percent of the glucose how it's going to occur normally without insulin muscle is very slightly permeable to the glucose that means without insulin your muscle is approximately unable to re re receive the glucose and the muscle uses fatty acid as a source of energy in the resting state now we need the glucose for the production of ATP what happens when the muscle become permeable to the glucose only in the two conditions one of them is the in the presence of the insulin just after the meals so when you take the meals when you take the carbohydrates in the diet what happens that it will cause the activation of different mechanisms through which your glucose can move into the cell we have seen in the previous uh, lecture that once it get attached uh, with its receptor and after the tyrosine kinase enzyme shows its activity what happens it will cause the translocation of the GLUT4 uh, that is a glucose transporter 4 they will move from the cytosol and attach with the membrane and glucose can move through them and the second thing is that during exercise when you perform the exercise during that time your muscle they become permeable for the glucose and at that time or you can say during exercise there is no need of the insulin for the opening of the transporters so these are the two conditions actually the once you perform the exercise your transporter the GLUT4 they remain attached to the membrane and not only for that time but up to six to seven hours they remain attached to the membrane that's why it's highly essential for the diabetic patient to perform the regular exercises so that the requirement of glucose should be reduced then storage of the glucose that is two to three percent in the form of the glycogen occurs that once the glucose entered into the muscle cell it is converted into the glycogen and stored there and that glycogen which is stored there that actually it is a glucose which is converted into glycopolymerase or you can say uh, converted into glycogen and this glycogen later on it can be used as a source of anaerobic energy by the stimulation of the glycogen synthase enzyme next liver uptake of the glucose due to the insulin the action or you can say action of insulin on the liver approximately 100 gram of the glycogen can be stored in the liver now liver has got again a GLUT2 transporter that means the glu there is no need uh, you can say the glucose can enter into the liver very easily through GLUT2 the insulin inactivate liver phosphorylase which causes the breakdown of the glycogen that means actually the in once the insulin is there it will try to form the glycogen for the storage purpose and the liver phosphorylase enzymes which are going to cause the breakdown of this glycogen they are inactivated by the insulin so the once the glycogen is formed it should be stored there so how it's stored there by the 
inactivation of the phosphorylase enzymes. Then it will activate an enzyme which is known as glucokinase. This glucokinase enzyme converts glucose into glucose 6-phosphate. Once this glucose 6-phosphate is formed, it is, it is trapped inside the cell and used for the energy purposes. Then there is activation of the glycogen synthase enzyme which is going to cause the synthesis of the glycogen. Then excess of the glucose in the liver is converted to the fatty acids. And these fatty acids later on they are stored in the form of triglyceride. Actually the triglyceride is the fo storage form of the fatty acids. So the glucose which is formed, which uh, first enters the liver, it should be converted into glycogen. The remaining glucose is converted to the fatty acid. These fatty acids, they are stored in the form of triglycerides in the adipose tissues. Then these triglycerides, they are packaged in the low density lipoprotein and they travel from liver to the different adipose tissues. So this is the action of the insulin on the uh, liver. Then effects of insulin, the fat metabolism. The one very important sentence written by the guidance is that the insulin acts as a fat sparer. That is, insulin is trying to spare the fat. It, it, insulin is trying to spare the fat means that insulin tries not to use the fat. Insulin tries actually to use the glucose. So the, once the insulin is not there, the fat becomes active and fats are used as a source of energy. So basic action, different actions of the insulin is to cause a fat, uh, it will act as a fat sparer hormone. How it's going to occur? Insulin use glucose in the top priority. That means the first choice of the source of energy for the insulin is the glucose. So the fat utilization is automatically decreased. When there is extra glucose in the liver, more than can be converted into the glycogen. First is, first choice is to convert the glucose into the glycogen. But if there is excess of the glucose, that glucose is used for the synthesis of the fatty acids. That is, glucose it will be converted into pyruvate, then pyruvate will be converted into the acetyl-CoA. This acetyl-CoA acts as a substrate for the fatty acid formation. When glucose is used for energy, extra citrate and isocitrates are produced. These will activate acetyl-CoA carboxylase enzyme. This will lead to the formation of melonyl-CoA, which is the first step in the formation of the fats. Melonyl-CoA is the first step or the first substance responsible for the synthesis of the fats. So, the glucose is ultimately is going to be converted into the fats by the formation of the melonyl-CoA. Then insulin activates a very important enzyme which is known as the lipoprotein lipase in the capillary walls of adipose tissues. What is the function of this one? Actually, this lipoprotein uh, lipase is going to split your triglycerides. Triglycerides, actually that triglyceride is the storage form. It has got glycerol, triglyceride, it has got glycerol along with the three fatty acids. So, this triglyceride, they are splitting up into their ingredients, their fatty acids. And then these fatty acids can be absorbed and once inside the adipose tissues, again they are converted into triglyceride for their storage. So, lipoprotein lipase, after its activation, it causes the storage of fat triglycerides into the adipose tissues. Then insulin inhibits the release of fatty acid from the adipose tissue. Actually, once your lipoprotein lipase activated by the insulin is going to cause the storage. Now the insulin is trying not to disturb that stored triglyceride. That is, insulin is trying to inhibit the release of fatty acid back to the plasma. It, these fatty acids, or you can say conversion of these fatty acids into triglyceride. Triglyceride is basically storage form. So insulin is trying to remain the in, uh, triglyceride in the storage form. It should not be disturbed. And it is done by the inhibition of the free, it is done by another enzyme, which is known as the hormone sensitive lipase. This is here the written hormone sensitive lipase. This high hormone sensitive lipase, it causes the hydrolysis of the stored triglycerides and release fatty acids in the circulation. So this 
enzyme hormone sensitive lipase which is responsible for the release of the free fatty acid from the fat depots from the storage form this enzyme is inhibited so that enzyme which causes the storage is activated and that enzyme which is causes the release is inhibited so by these two enzyme insulin promotes the storage of the fat again i am saying that it is a fat spirit enzyme so it is causes not up to that we have seen that it causes the formation of fat through the melanoid coa it causes the storage of fat through lipoprotein it causes the inhibition of fat release through the your insulin sensitive lipase inhibition so all these three functions that top one they are performed production production of the melanoid ka and fatty acids then storage of the fatty acids then inhibition of release of the fatty acids from the storage form then insulin produce promotes growth uh, sorry glucose transport into the fat cell this is very important that the fatty acids they also moves into the cell with the uh, under the effect of insulin thus this glucose is used for the fatty acid synthesis that is the glycerol phosphate used for the synthesis of the triglycerides actually the triglycerides it is triglycerides as if you see the structure of this triglyceride they are three trimene three there are three uh, fatty acids with attached with a glycerol phosphate so insulin promotes the glucose transport into the fat cells also fats once the actually insulin is going to promote the transport of glucose in when the beta cells in the liver at the same time it also causes the transport with to move or the glucose transport into the fat cells in the fat cell what happens this glucose is used for the synthesis of the fatty acids then in the brain here you can see normally that brain uses glucose the main source of energy for the brain is the glucose normally use glucose as source of energy no need of insulin for it that is a diabetic patient having low level of the insulin don't need insulin for the utilization of glucose in glucose in the brain brain can use fats for the energy but with the difficulty this is not an easy task for the brain now the blood sugar level below 50 if the your blood sugar level normal blood sugar level it should be remain between fasting blood sugar should be less than 110 and postprandial should be less than 140 postprandial now if blood sugar level lowers down actually we need glucose every time in our blood every time we need we don't need hyperglycemia that more glucose we don't need hypoglycemia low blood sugar level we don't need both these we need blood glucose level every time in our body within the normal range so if the blood sugar level goes below the 50 it may start the symptoms of the hypoglycemia that means low blood sugar level and this hypoglycemia may lead to the uh, unconsciousness it may cause the uh, disturb function of the brain we will see later on the different side effects of the hypoglycemia then the effects uh, of the insulin on the proteins the insulin pro promotes the protein synthesis and the storage same with the case with the uh, your fats that it will promote the synthesis of the fats and the storage of the fat same is the case with the proteins it will cause the promotion of the protein not only the synthesis but the storage of the proteins so this is the that, that's why when the patient is suffering from the diabetes that means where there is less amount of insulin is there at that time what happens <coughs> there is the protein wasting and the patient become weak now insulin stimulates the movement of amino acids into the cell the first step the amino acids should moved into the cell this is caused by the insulin then what are the those amino acids which are moved the priority basis these are the valine leucine isoleucine tyrosine the phenylalanine then insulin stimulates the translation of the messenger rna for the synthesis of the new proteins then insulin increase the rate of transcription of selected dna that means to for, for the formation of the more rna once the more rna is there there is more proteins then it inhibits the catabolism of the proteins that means on one side it is going to do the synthesis of the proteins on the other side they are going to, or they are trying to inhibit the breakdown of the proteins 
Then in the liver, it inhibits the gluconeogenesis. Insulin inhibits the gluconeogenesis. There is formation of glucose from the others uh, other than the carbohydrate sources. That is mainly the amino acids. So in the liver, uh, your insulin is going to inhibit the gluconeogenesis. So the substrate for this purpose is was your amino acids. So these amino acids which should be utilized, which may be utilized for the formation of glucose, as you can say, in the gluconeogenesis, they are saved. This is another form of the uh, how the insulin is going to save your amino acids, or in other words, how the insulin is going to save your proteins. Then uh, the word of which I have already told the sentence: insulin deficiency. That is in the case of diabetes, it will causes the protein depletion in the plasma amino acids. These extra amino acids used for the gluconeogenesis. The, again, I am going to uh, repeat this sentence. Deficiency of insulin, it, what it will cause? It will cause the protein depletion. How the protein depletion in the... Actually, the protein depletion occurs because plasma amino acids are increased and these extra amino acids, they are used for the gluconeogenesis. So, the protein wasting is a common sign in the diabetes mellitus. I am going to repeat to make you understand that in case of diabetes, that means in case of deficiency of insulin, the plasma amino acids, they are become deficient. Then what we are going to this, sorry, the plasma amino acids, they increase. So this extra, or you can, you can say the increased plasma amino acids, they are used for the gluconeogenesis. So the protein wasting is a common diabetes, in common in diabetes mellitus. Then insulin and the growth hormone, they act synergistically to promote the growth. Actually, this insu if uh, it is seen in the experimental animals, that if you give insulin only without growth hormone, growth is not promoted. And if you give only growth hormone without insulin, again growth is not promoted. For the proper growth, you have to give both insulin and the growth hormone so both of them, them, they act synergistically to promote the growth. And this, actually the insulin causes the movement of amino acids into the cell. We have seen the previous slide. Then they, they inhibit the gluconeogenesis. So the glu amino acids, they remain saved. And they are utilized for the growth purpose. So the growth hormone and the insulin, they act synergistically for the promotion of the growth. Now these slides, they are uh, you can it in the tabulated form that the action, the metabolism, uh, the carbohydrate metabolism. Again, the tabulated form for the lipid metabolism. Then the protein metabolism. I have told you all these things. Then this is the same one where you have pro-insulin, insulin, then the formation, all these things. We are not concerned with the digestive uses actually now. This diagram is added. This diagram is added because this is present in your book guide. Then you can see uh, we have discussed this in the previous lecture that the, once the glucose enters into the beta cell, actually this is a beta cell uh, of the pancreas and where you have got the GLUT2, the glucose enter into here and after the process it is going to produce ATP. Then ATP is going to cause the closure of the ATP sensitive potassium channels. The potassium level is going to increase. It will cause the opening of the calcium channels. Calcium will move in. It will, it will cause the release of the insulin into the plasma. Now, here is the blood glucose regulation during well-fed state. That means when you take the meals, when you take the carbohydrates, the glucose is absorbed into the portal vein. And on the other side, the pancreas is going to release your insulin. So this glucose enters into the liver. In the liver, the first try of the glucose is to convert into glycogen, that is the storage form. Then this glucose is going to uh, metabolize through the pyruvate, ultimately it can be converted into the fat and these fats, they are moved to the adipose tissue for their storage. And then this glucose can be moved to the RBCs where you don't need of any insulin. If they have got the GLUT1, we will see later on. Now, uh, what are different types of the GLUT? There's the GLUT1 is present over here. They don't need insulin for their metabolism. And we need constant supply of the glucose in the RBC. So this glucose, after entering the liver, it may move to the RBCs. 
and it may form the lactate which again entered into the pyruvate. This lactate is formed due to the anaerobic metabolism. Lactate moves to the pyruvate and pyruvate can again convert into the fat. Then this glucose can move to the brain and utilize as a source of energy without insulin. Then this glucose, one side we have seen that the glucose is converted to the glycogen for the storage. This glucose can move enters into the muscle cell. Actually here we need the GLUT4, where we need the insulin for the translocation of the GLUT4 to the membrane. Because in the muscle, without insulin, the muscle can't uptake the glucose. The muscle can uptake the glucose only in the presence of the insulin or in the during exercise. So that the different fate of the, you can say glucose, it can be moved or stored in the glycogen, it can move convert to the fat and store in the adipose tissues. It can move to the RBC for your metabolism and production of lactate. Lactate again going to form the pyruvate. It can move to the muscle where it can be stored in the form of the glycogen. It can move to the brain and utilize there. This is the same diagram for the insulin receptors. Actually, this diagram is added because you can well understand that these alpha units there's alpha units, there's the insulin going to attack and there's phosphate groups they are attached with the beta subunits. This will cause ultimately to a different action we have seen in the previous lecture. This is your actually the glucose transporter protein, Do you know the GLUT, G -L -U -T. and it is not mentioned with what type of it is because actually this diagram is going to, uh, you can say, see, you can see easily that transporter is present in the cytoplasm and this move to the membrane and glucose will enter through this transporter. So insulin is going to attach with the receptor over here and transporter is something different. Now, different types of the glucose transporters. We have got actually up, to, up till now the different 14 types of the glucose transporters has been discovered. But we are concerned basically with the four glucose transporters. The one of them is the GLUT1. This is present in all the tissues, but they are important in the RBCs and the epithelial cells of the blood brain barrier. The actually what happens, why the in the RBC? This GLUT1 that it remains open forever. There is no need of insulin to for the translocation to the membrane. They are insulin independent, that they don't need insulin. Actually, your RBC needs constant supply of the glucose. The glucose enters the RBC by the facilitatory diffusion via specific glucose transporter. Now, normally, actually, the normally glucose can enter in the RBC, but with the help of this GLUT1, this rate of transmission or this rate of facilitatory diffusion can be decreased 50,000 times than the normal. So, in uncatalyzed form, Transmembrane diffusion is far less as compared to the catalyzed form through this GLUT1 which is present over the surface of the RBC. This glucose transporter of the RBC which is also known as the GLUT1. This is why the name is GLUT1 given it just to distinguish it from the other glucose transporters which are present in the other tissues. This GLUT1 is responsible for the low level of basal glucose uptake required for the sustained respiration of all the cells. Actually, GLUT1 is present in all the tissues, all the tissues, and very low level of glucose can enter through it. And this is this glucose one, GLUT1 is responsible for the low level of basal glucose uptake. That is very small amount of glucose can enter through this one and this is utilized to maintain the respiration in all the cells. Respiration means metabolization of that glucose and formation of energy. Then GLUT1 is also a major receptor for the uptake of the vitamin C as well as the glucose. So the GLUT1 is not only taking up the glucose, it also take up the vitamin C, especially in the non-vitamin C producing members as a part of their adaptation. And this is also present in number of the, their number actually, the number of the GLUT1 is increased in case of hypoglycemia, that is a low blood level of the glucose and in the some tumors it also increased. Then we have got the GLUT2. 
Actually, GLUT2, you can memorize it. 2 means bidirectional transporter. That glucose can enter or leave through this transporter. And this is present or expressed in the kidneys, in the liver, and the pancreatic beta cells. The basolateral membrane of the small intestine also. So these are present mainly liver, kidney, and uh, beta cells of pancreas, the small intestine. This is bidirectionality is required in the liver cells to uptake the glucose for the glycolysis and the release of glucose during gluconeogenesis. Actually, what happens? When you are in the fed state, when you have taken the meal, you have taken the glucose. This glucose is going to be stored in the form of glycogen. And when you are with the fasting, when you are not taking the meals, between the meals, you can say that glucose, glycogen is breakdown of glycogen occurs. And this breakdown, as you can say, catabolism of the glycogen occurs. And this glycogen releases the glucose into the uh, your plasma and so the normal glucose level is maintained between the meals so at that time when you when you want to release a glucose from the liver you need this type of the glut 2 type of the uh, transporters in the pancreas beta cells free flowing of glucose is required so the intracellular environment of these cells can accurately gauge the serum glucose level so the glucose uh, this glut transporter is importantly required in the liver so that liver can uptake the glucose and can release the glucose same is the case with the, your beta cells of the pancreas they need this uh, glucose uh, transporter too so that they can uptake the glucose easily and all three monosaccharides that is glucose galactose and the fructose they can use this glut too they are transported from the intestinal mucosa cells into the portal circulation by the glut too all the, that means different types of the uh, you can see the monosaccharide, different types of glucose, that is example is the glucose, galactose and fructose. They are transported in the intestine through this GLUT2. Then we have got the GLUT3. They are expressed mostly in the brain, that is in neurons. And they don't need any type of the insulin for that. That means no need of insulin in the GLUT3. That means your brain don't need insulin for the entry of glucose into the cells. That's also known as the independent uh, insulin independent glut through. No need of insulin. They are also present in the present also. Then we have got the glut 4. Here is the diabetes. Once glut we reach the glut 4, the glut 4 they are present in the mainly the two areas. Your muscle cells, the mainly the striated muscles, the skeletal muscles, the cardiac muscles, and we need insulin for the uptake of the glucose through these GLUT4 receptors. So insulin, if insulin is not there, this GLUT4 can be translocated to the membrane. And if they are not translocated to the membrane, your muscles cannot uptake your glucose and can be converted into glycogen for the stored form, which is utilized during the initial phase of the exercise. So the GLUT4, they need insulin. Here is the tabulated form of the GLUT1, 2, 3, 4. GLUT1 present in the RBCs in some part of the heart to a lesser extent. They are also present in the blood brain barrier to some extent. And they are insulin independent. That means they don't need insulin. Then GLUT2, they are mainly present in the liver, pancreas, small intestine. Again, they are insulin independent. Then the GLUT3, which is mainly present in the brain and the sperm, they, again, they don't need insulin. And we are basically concerned in the case of diabetes, the GLUT4, which is present in the skeletal muscles, adipose tissue in the heart. And they need, although this sentence is not, it, it is no, this, uh, you can say, portion is blank, but there must be written that they need insulin. GLUT4, they need insulin for their translocation to the membrane. So in the diabetic patient, problem is with the GLUT4. This again is a tabulated form of different types of the receptors. Here in the top, just in the top, you will see there is a sodium glucose transporter. They are present in the kidneys and the intestine. When we will study uh, the kidney, then we will see this sodium. There are again two types. Sodium glucose transporters are also there. Now, this was all about the <coughs> transporter, <coughs> transporters of the glucose and the different actions of the insulin on the carbohydrates, proteins, fats in the brain. We have seen all these things. Thank you very much.
we will see in the next lecture the diabetes mellitus and its complication thank you very much